Hi there, I'm Judy Holland, and welcome to Happy Nest, the podcast where you can hear the latest research and best advice for living well when your kids leave home. Join me as I interview experts and explore how to reinvent yourself during this critical passage. I hope you'll head over to judyhollandauthor.com and check out my new book, Happy Nest, Finding Fulfillment When Your Kids Leave Home. Dr. Terry Orbach, a.k.a. The Love Doctor, is a superstar expert on love relationships. She's also an author, speaker, therapist, professor at Oakland University, and researcher at the University of Michigan. Terry has authored six books, including Five Simple Steps to Take Your Marriage from Good to Great and Finding Love Again, Six Simple Steps to a New and Happy Relationship. She's also the director of a landmark study funded by the National Institutes of Health, where she has been following the same 373 couples for almost three decades. Terry has appeared on tons of national media, and her relationship segments are aired on Fox TV Detroit. Her PBS TV program is titled Secrets from the Love Doctor. Dr. Terry Orbach, so glad you could join us today on the Happiness Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Terry, how can living in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic strain your marriage? How can it How do you keep from suffocating your spouse or being suffocated by your spouse in close quarters? Oh, a really good question, Judy. Well, first, I don't think any of us know couples out there are really used to spending 24-7 with our partner without all the distractions of other friends, of other activities, of other things that are going on. So I don't think we're used to that. And so now that we're together 24-7, It's very different. And I think we need to have these strategies where we not only give each other space, privacy, and time alone, but we also find time to do fun and interesting things together. So it's like this balance, Judy. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. We'll, We'll go a little bit more in depth with me about how is this time of COVID different from the usual wear and tear on a marriage. And again, it's the, it's the lack, as you're saying, it's kind of the lack of, of other things. I normally see so many people in my week all through the, all through the day. Right. And now I've got three kids, three dogs and the husband. And, and, and how do I, how do I keep from throwing him off the roof? (laughs) (laughs) Very good question. A question that many couples are asking. Well, I think first, like you said, and like I said before, we aren't used to not having other distractions, other friends, other going to work in the morning or during the day, uh, getting together at restaurants or coffee shops, wine, uh, you know, places, uh, bars to spend time with other people. And then we bring all of that, Judy, into our relationship at the end of the day or even at the beginning of the day. So now we are doing and seeing each other 24-7. And as you said, we might have children in the house again. We might have parents in the house. So first, I think it's really important that each of us take care of ourselves as individuals so that we make sure we're doing all those self-care techniques techniques that we think we're doing um, at other periods of time. But really now it's so important because if we're not healthy, sleeping well, eating well, doing exercise, meditating, relaxing, doing things for ourselves, then we can't do for others. So that I think is the number one important strategy that we all need to remember to do self-care. And then second, I think it's also important to share our concerns, anxieties, and fears with our partner and even with our family members who might also be living with us. Otherwise, if we keep everything in, Judy, it gets bigger and it grows. So it's very important to discuss and share 
specifically with our partner, but not do it all day. Because as you probably know, and as I know in my house, if we're watching television, if we're on our phones or our computers, we could be involved and engaged in what's happening out there all day, every day. And that's just going to spill over into our relationship. So what I like to say to couples is find a time that you can talk and share with your partner during the day, but make it one period of time, either over breakfast or dinner at night, or you even have what I call a family or a relationship meeting where you do that together. And I have many other strategies. Should I keep on going? Yes, or- yes, absolutely. Um, The third thing is that I think it's really important to remember that we're all very serious right now. We need to be healthy. We need to, you know, have money coming into the household. We might have our children and we're educating them, doing schoolwork with them. We might even have our parents at another, at another house or another state that we're also concerned with. But it's so important with our partner that we remember to have fun with one another. Laughter helps reduce stress. It also bonds partners together. It can even reignite or ignite passion, Judy. So I encourage people to play board games with each other, do a puzzle together, play games, watch funny movies, even watch comedians online on YouTube together. Laugh have fun. Remember that relationships are also about fun. So very important. And as I said earlier, give each other space. Having space and privacy is also very important to a relationship, particularly if you're home 24-7. But instead of saying to your partner, I need time or I need space from you, (laughs) which sends confusing signals, make sure that you say, This afternoon, can I just have two hours to have a virtual talk with my best friend, call my mom, read a book, watch a YouTube online, and then I'll come back and we can spend some time together or I can help my daughter, son with homework. But just say, I need time to do X. And that's okay. Whether it's in the same room or a separate room, time to self even now is really very important. No, that's great. That's great, Terry. So you and I before have talked about novelty. When I went on your show, we talked about research on novelty and how novelty, doing new and novel activities with your partner bolsters romantic relationships. And how can we, I'd love it if you can talk about why novelty sparks the brain and makes us feel closer to our partners. And then how maybe we can find novel activities when we are cooped up inside. Oh, and I loved having you on my show, Um, (laughs) Judy. Thank you so much. You were great. Um, There are three factors that can reignite passion and bolster romantic relationships. They're new and novel activities, number one. Mystery or surprising activities, number two and arousal producing activities number three. And they all reignite passion because they were all present at the beginning of a romantic relationship when passion and excitement and arousal were high in the relationship. Studies show, research shows, my own included, that over time, novelty declines, mystery and surprise decline, and these arousal producing activities decline. And that's why, Judy, we also see a decline of passionate love or excitement. But you can reignite that feeling and that passionate love in a relationship. So you can do new and novel activities together. So for example, if you're cooped up inside 24 seven with your partner, you could decide to take a Spanish class with your partner virtually. You've never done that. You could do it together and that would reignite the passion. Anything new or novel that you haven't done before with your partner can reignite passion. For example, another thing that you could do that I would love to do with my (laughs) husband (laughs) is that we've never taken a cooking class, right, together. Mm -hmm. So we could actually get online. They're offering these great virtual cooking classes, get the ingredients, make 
the meal together and that would ignite some passion and then eat the meal that we created together, Mm -hmm. which would again be new and novel and reignite that passion. Terry, does Mystery. he does he want to do that too? Does he like yes. to, to cook? He too? actually does. <laughs> yes, which would be nice, right? And that's really important, Judy. You brought up a good point <laughs> that it has to be a new and novel activity that you both want to do or desire to do together. So that's really important. Now, the thing that I would like to do that my husband <laughs> wouldn't would be like take a salsa dance class together online, uh, which is a great activity. I've been telling this to my clients doing any kind of dance class together that would be new and different with each other would be great because you get the new and novel activity as we've been discussing. It might be a surprise. You've got touch and an arousal producing activity because what we know as well, Judy, through studies is that if you do some activity that creates adrenaline or arousal with your partner, the arousal that's created through that other activity like dance or like an online exercise class that you could take with your partner when you're cooped up inside, the arousal that's produced through that other activity can get transferred to your partner and your relationship. And it can create and reignite that passion that you had at the beginning of your relationship. Absolutely. And I I just listened to your TEDx talk, Terry, that I loved. And on that TEDx talk, you, you, you you mentioned this too, also that that's kind of a way we we're kind of tricked by this, right? We're tricked by the, the chemicals that go into our brain when we're doing an activity like this. So it, it, it's kind of contagious and it spreads to our feeling about our partner and we want to make sure that we don't want to spread it to the wrong partner right but we but but it's a it's kind of a trick in a positive way yes I love it you want to absolutely make sure that you're doing it with your partner and not somebody else and then you can trick your mind you can trick your mind in terms of the hormones and the adrenaline that's going through your body but also you trick your mind because it's really produced through dance or exercise or a scary movie or a comedy show. Even laughter can do this, Judy, because you think it's through this other activity, but then you look at your partner and your mind attributes that adrenaline, that arousal to your partner and your feelings for that partner. So absolutely an easy thing that you can do with your partner when you're home cooped up inside and you're together 24 seven to reignite that passion and get closer to one another. The other one factor that I didn't mention as well as mystery and surprise. And you can also do that. For example, let's say it's your partner's birthday or you're celebrating an anniversary. You can decorate the living room, the kitchen, even your bedroom as your partner's in another room. They come back into the room and they're surprised. Wow, I didn't think you would remember it was our anniversary (laughs) or my birthday. I didn't think we were going to do it anything because we can't go out, anything that you do that's surprising. I like to say it's that oh wow moment or oh wow feeling. If you can get that out of your partner, that will recreate passion and excitement. We need to be creative then, right? And we need to put a little time into thinking of how we can create an element of mystery or surprise just, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a big deal doesn't need to be expensive. It just takes some thought and some planning and some energy. Absolutely. We just need to be creative. And it's these simple things, even writing a a card on a regular piece of paper and saying to your partner, I would still choose you if I had to do this all over again, would be surprising and creative and very simple to do for your partner. Wonderful. Well, what now you were talking also about, you had a third element. You have New and- so it's new and novel activities, which would be number one. Mystery and surprising activities would be number two. And then the arousal producing activities that you can do with your partner, you trick your mind that are adrenaline producing or arousal producing with your partner would be number three. Mm-hmm. Okay, dancing, but you can't get your husband to dance. Your husband doesn't like dancing, Terry. 
He doesn't like salsa dancing. Yes. He thinks he's not good, Judy. (laughs) So then he doesn't want to do it. That would be my dream. If we could do salsa dancing and then do a cooking class and then eat what we cooked with some wine, that would be great. (laughs) Doesn't that sound good? (laughs) Create your own party. That sounds perfect to me. Yeah, that that sounds perfect. Let's talk about self-disclosure. Um, a lot of the research I've looked at, and I know you've you've spoken on this and probably researched on this as well. What does self-disclosure, Terry, have to do with keeping r- romantic relationships thriving? Mm, it has a lot to do with romantic relationships thriving and surviving. Self-disclosure is when we reveal personal information about ourselves And it's real communication because I think most couples think they're disclosing and sharing and communicating, but what they're really doing, Judy, is what I call maintenance talk. They're talking about who's going to do the grocery shopping or clean the house or call mom or pay the bills. But self-disclosure, when you talk about real things that are personal to you, that make you you, is real communication. And what that does is a few things. First, it creates or maintains trust in a relationship. So when we have trust or when we want to build trust with someone, one way to do that is to disclose information about ourselves. And there's this great thing in psychology, which is called reciprocity of Mm self-disclosure, which means that if we disclose something about ourselves, our partner will disclose something about themselves in kind at the same level of intimacy. Ah. So you can get your partner to disclose information about themselves in two ways. You can ask them, really poignant personal questions. But the second way is disclosing information or revealing things about yourself. So self-disclosure builds trust and it maintains trust. And trust is such an important essential ingredient in any romantic relationship. It means that we, uh, uh, our partner is reliable is predictable, has our best interests at heart, and is open and honest. And you want that to continue throughout a romantic relationship. The second thing disclosure does is it builds a couple identity. I like to call this like a we, W-E factor. Mm -hmm. It's when we think of us as a pair, as a team. And when we think of us as a pair or as a team, that bonds us, that creates intimacy, and that glues us together over time. So you can see when people are bonded and a couple identity, when they say, we went to the movies, we thought about this, we did this. And those are all good signs or signals of love and intimacy and bonding. And one way to do that is to have self-disclosure, reveal personal information about yourself. So we're staying away from the me, me, me and and trading that in for more we in, in the way that we think and the way that we speak. Exactly. Now, I don't think that you have to be totally enmeshed in your relationship, Judy. So you can still do things separately. Right. You can still have your space, your friends, your privacy, your own interests. You should not be only we. So two eyes and one we, but the degree to which you can build a we and continue to maintain that we is very important for trust, for bonding, for intimacy, and for love in a long-term relationship. Wonderful. So Terry, many of us, myself included, have young adults who have coronavirus boomeranged back home for who knows how long. How do we, I have two college kids and a Nashville singer-songwriter, and I'm not sure, and three dogs, literally 250 pounds worth of of (laughs) dogs, including a Great Dane barreling through my house. So Mm -hmm. how do we bring harmony, more harmony to the family unit in the Mm -hmm. midst of this uncertainty and, you know, who knows really when we're out of this captivity. Right. Because there is uncertainty 
And there are many challenges when you have people in one household that either haven't been there before or are very different for, from one another. I think the first thing, Judy, that's so important is to accept that there are going to be differences, except that everyone in the house may have a different emotional response to deal with the stress and challenges of COVID-19 right. and sheltering at home. And that's okay. It doesn't mean it's bad. Even if you have differences from your romantic partner, it doesn't mean that your relationship is in trouble or that you're not supposed to, quote, be together. So first, accept that the young adults that are coming back into your house have been independent. They were doing things differently than you might. And so accepting and acknowledging and recognizing those differences is very important. Now, how do you do that, <laughs> which can be difficult? First, um, I encourage empathy. Oftentimes, if we can empathize and understand why someone else is responding a different way, thinking a different way, behaving a different way, um, emotionally wanting something different, if we can understand, put ourselves in their shoes and empathize, that brings them closer to us. And then second, recognize that part of that person and their responses and their differences could be part of you. So that if your daughter is reacting anxiously, so she wants to watch television and the news 24 seven, but it makes you more anxious to watch the television, you would empathize and understand why she might need this and then recognize how it might be part of you as well. And that's all part of empathy. And then second, is compromise, sometimes doing it one person's way, sometimes doing it another person's way, coming in the middle and doing it all differently. And then finally trying to have some structure. Structure in the household with a family allows people to know and understand what's coming up. Even though it might be uncertain outside, if we can give structure inside our households and our family, that can help us deal with the challenges and bring more harmony to the family union. So that might be rules, it might be family meetings, it might be every day or every week sitting down and saying, who's going to do this? Who's going to make the dinner? What are we doing? Let's have a plan, put it on the calendar, or even having family fun scheduled into the week or the day. That structure will allow the family to have more harmony as well. No, that's great. And I have found recently by trial and error that I have been greatly praising and encouraging at creative effort that I see to contribute to the household <laughs> dynamic. And I see, you know, my, my daughter came in and created a wonderful dish for dinner the other night and I kept talking about it and asking about it and she actually was very pleased to share how she came up with that she's a vegetarian you know then I've got a mm -hmm. meatarian that wants to make sure that he that he's that he's got all his protein at a level that the rest of us don't but but he is jumping in on other levels but I'm just making sure that I acknowledge it and that I recognize that they're feeling pressured with studies and my my daughter can't record her the rest of her album right now because she's not in Nashville, but but I want to make sure and encourage that. Is that you? Is that part of the package? I think that's wonderful, Judy. Encouraging and supporting their individuality, their creativity, as you said, and as we were talking about relationships and romantic relationships, giving them space. One of the things that I had to deal with is understanding that when my kids came back, I have one child back, not two, but one child came back and allowing her space in her room yeah. and it being okay if she doesn't want to eat with the family or my husband and I, or at a different time. So giving them space as well 
like I give my partner or my husband and I want space to myself as well is so important when we're all together 24 seven. So I love what you've been doing as well, Judy. And I love you say, I love your comment that you don't say my reaction. I am a little bit more of a hothead than you. I might say, I need some space and that's wrong. It's better to say, you know, I really need to get out, look at some leaves, take a walk, clear my head and I'll be back in 45 minutes. At that point, I can work on this job with you. I love that. Those I statements are (laughs) so important. Instead of saying, you are bugging me or irritating me or you're on me all the time. Instead, because then people get defensive and they get angry. I like that. And in fact, even as you said it, I wanted to do it. Um, I would love to go out on a walk outside and look at the, the sun and the fresh air. And I will be back in 45 minutes. That's a really wonderful way. And even saying why. I would be so happy or I need some fresh air so that I can feel good. I can feel healthy. I would like to go out all very important statements because then the person can't disagree, really. You're saying what you need and how it makes you feel. And so then they can't dismiss that, which is wonderful as well. Right. So this, those I messages, I'm going to remember that. My mother used to talk about those. She's now in her mid eighties. And it, it was really in vogue when I was, <laughs> when I was in high school to talk about I messages. And this is the first time I've thought of it since, since back then. That's, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's that it's mm-hmm. still true. Um, it's still true. It's can, still true. <laughs> so I, I at, was interviewing a professor, Richard Slatcher, he's now in Georgia yes. about, um, yes. he's doing a huge global study on how this pandemic might be affecting marriage relationships over the long term. I think also maybe family relationships. We, of course, we look to spin things positively, but starting with a negative first, do you think this is going to break some relationships? Is it going to make some better? Is it going to help us get to know each other more? What What do you think the effect of this will be? We can, we can get a jump on Richard Slatcher. trying to predict what his results will be. Well, I like to say, Judy, that the pandemic has the ability to either stress relationships more or it has the ability to have partners appreciate the relationship and their partner more. And why I like to underline has the ability, because I would love to give the control or I think the control lies within the partners. The partners have the ability to either allow the stress to come in and exacerbate or uh, influence the stress or distress that is already there, or partners have the ability to do little simple things to appreciate their partner more. And so I think that it depends on the control of the partner, as well as where was the relationship before the pandemic. I mean, we know that in general, there are always going to be stressors in our world, whether it be our jobs, our financial strain, um, our children, our parents, right? Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of stressors that can impact us and our relationship. But now, if your relationship was already in distress and you're together 24-7, it does have the ability to exacerbate that distress. And so relationships that were already stressed in distress are going to get exacerbated. However, couples who were okay, so, so good or great have the ability to take simple strategies like we've been talking about. They're not big, but they're simple. They're small. They're practical. They're within your control to appreciate the relationship even more, to appreciate your partner, your children, your family, your financial situation, your jobs, even more. Mm-hmm. No, that's wonderful. So as we lead to our toward our wrap up here, what, Terry, you are such a wonderfully articulate and clear speaking guest. It's such a pleasure 
to talk to you every time. What, Thank you. What did I, as a longtime journalist, I sometimes just forget to ask a good question. And and is is there a question that I forgot to ask you? What is there something you'd like to add that I've skipped over? Mm, that's good. By the way, thank you for <laughs> those comments, those kind comments about um, how I've been talking and, and my comments in general. I think I always think about gender um, and whether or not in relationships, there are differences between men and women. And there's a lot been written on this, as you know, Judy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a psychologist in general, I like to say that I don't want to always talk about gender and I don't want to always talk about men versus women and are there differences by gender because in social psychology, lots of gender similarities appear rather than gender differences. However, as I've been studying couples now, I have been following these same 373 couples now for over 30 years in a nationally funded study, National Institutes of Health funded study. I have found that gender is still very important in terms of relationships. What's important to men are not always important to women. And the questions that women ask to see if they're happy in their relationships are not always the same questions that men ask to see if they're happy in their relationships. So I like to say that men and women still are different and there are differences, significant differences when it comes to relationships and how they progress and how they develop over time. Whether you're single, partnered, divorced, widowed, or wanting a long-term relationship. Wonderful. No, that's that's a fascinating era, area. I am similarly fascinated by gender roles and gender conflict or gender strengths, and, and that's a big area. I will come back and talk to you some more about that because I on another on great. another day I love that topic. Um, Thank you. That would be wonderful. That's a that's a huge. That is just a flashing light in my head all the time. These gender differences. It's just just from a from a, a journalist point of view. Well, anyway, where can you have so many great insights and you've got shows and everything? Where can people find you, Terry, if they want to see more of what you've what you've come up with? <laughs> I would love for listeners to connect with me. My website is Dr. Terry, D R T E R R I, the love doctor.com. So it's Dr. Terry, the love doctor.com. And I have two popular books based on that long term study one for couples and one for singles. The one for couples is Five Simple Steps to Take Your Marriage from Good to Great. And it's based on the happy couples over 30 years and what they did to maintain and keep their relationships happy and stable. And the second book is Finding Love Again, Six Simple Steps to a New and Happy Relationship. And that's all about those individuals who divorced or lost a spouse due to death. And who repartnered, who didn't, what are the factors that led people to repartner, the effects of divorce on individuals and their children, and what do people do and how is it different if you lost a spouse due to death versus a divorce? Wow, terrific. You've you've got all the bases covered, Terry. That's wonderful. Um, thank you. All science based too. I lo- I know it. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's always such a breath of fresh air to speak to you, and it's a delight. And I learn new things every time I talk to you. Thank you so much for having me, Judy, and thank you again also for being on my program as well. You bet. Thanks for tuning into my Happiness Podcast, where we explore how to get the best out of the empty nest. I hope you'll subscribe, write a review, and reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Check out my website, judyhollandauthor.com. Have a great day, and remember, make it happen.